In this video, we'll cover what is the momentum factor, does it work, uh, and then one question that you guys have been really interested in is how the uh, momentum index or ETF MTUM compares to the NASDAQ QQQ. So I'm going to be showing you guys what the long-term returns of the momentum index are compared to the NASDAQ uh, going back to 1985. And then finally, at the end of the video, we'll talk about three simple ways that you can apply momentum to making your next investment decision. So first of all, what is momentum? The easiest way to think about momentum is just uh, <laughs> going back to a physics class from uh, fourth grade or whatever grade we learned this. Um, so Newton's first law of motion says that basically every object that's in motion is going to stay in motion unless it's acted upon by an outside force. This same concept applies to investing. So research shows that in general, stocks moving up generally continue to move up unless some force acts upon them. Some of the reasons for why that is the case here in a minute. Uh, but first, we'll get on to the seven reasons why you should use momentum. Uh, first of all, the research on momentum has aged exceptionally well. So the first academic study on momentum was done in 1937. So typically, you would think that once a piece of information is known or published, all investors will then jump in on that idea and it will basically arbitrage away any opportunity that may have existed before. Um, but momentum has continued to work even after decades of investors knowing um, that it does work. So number two, uh, winners generally do better than losers. So a 1993 study by Jagadish and Tittman showed that stocks that were outperforming over the trailing three to 12 months persisted in outperforming over the next three to 12 months and then vice versa for stocks that were doing poorly. The difference between the winning stocks and the losing stocks was 12% per year. So this Momentum is a big deal for you. It can, it can make a big difference in helping you achieve better investment returns. Uh, so buy winners, don't buy losers. Uh, number three, momentum is everywhere. A uh, 2012 study uh, found that 58 different assets uh, have exhibited statistically significant momentum effects. This includes, obviously, stocks are part of that, but currencies, bonds, commodities, real estate, all types of assets exhibit momentum, which generally suggests that it's a pervasive, likely behavioral error that investors make, and that's across all different countries and assets. Number four, it works because humans are irrational. So there's a, a body of thought, you know, the old economic theory, and, and some people still believe it today, but um, is that we all make perfectly rational decisions. So consumers consider every single bit of utility they're gonna get from buying a couch before they buy it, and they weigh that against the cost. But all kinds of research suggests that that's simply not true. Uh, and it also applies to investors. So investors do not make perfectly rational decisions. We exhibit lots of herd behaviors. I mean, there's all kinds of emotional uh, biases that make us bad at investing. Um, two of these that contribute to the momentum factor are the disposition effect and anchoring bias. Anchoring bias is a similar phenomenon to what happens whenever you see an item on sale. So if the, the, this shirt, for example, was, I don't know, $100, some ridiculous shirt, uh, that's the MSRP price, but you see it on sale for $20. In your mind, you will generally anchor to whatever price you saw first, and then the $20 sale looks very appealing. This also works in investing. So if you paid, let's say you paid $100 for a stock, you are automatically anchored to this price. So the more the price goes down, let's say it goes down to 50, 
you remain anchored to this $100. And that kind of gives you this idea that uh, I want to get back to $100. That $100 price point is is important, uh, even though the new information is the stock is 50. You know, but 100 remains very important in your mind, and that's that's irrational. Number two, the disposition effect. So this is just the idea that investors, you and me, we hate taking losses. So that means that we will generally exhibit risk-seeking behavior by holding on to our losers. So we don't want to lock in losses. So we're going to hold on to a loser until we get at least back to even. Um, and that's why we generally hold on to stocks that are, are bad stocks. The opposite occurs for gains. So we have a, a stock that's went up 100% and a stock that's went down 50%. In general, we're going to want to sell the one that's gone up 100%, uh, even if that may be the better long-term company, long-term better stock. Um, we're reluctant to take the loss. We're much more willing to lock in those gains. So in general, winners get sold irrationally and losers get held irrationally, uh, which is one of the explanations for why momentum continues to work. Uh, number five. Momentum can reduce risk. So there's a really interesting book, and I'll put a link to it in the description, called Dual Momentum Investing. The, the author of that book does a lot of in-depth research on momentum, and he uses both relative momentum, which is basically how is this stock doing relative to another stock. So the, the market's up 10%, this stock is up 20%, so it has relatively better momentum. He also uses absolute momentum, which is simply, is this asset class or is this stock going up? Has it gone up? Um, so he combines those two factors to create dual momentum. And he back tests the strategy. And what he found was by using both uh, the absolute and relative momentum, his strategy, which was a couple ETFs, had a maximum drawdown, meaning top to bottom loss, of 22%. And that compares to a maximum drawdown of 60% for the overall market index. In this case, he's using uh, the ACWI index, which is basically the entire world. Um, so momentum can potentially reduce risk, according to his research. Number six, momentum still seems to work. So despite it, the first published study being done in 1937 and multiple studies being done thereafter, you know, at this point there's hundreds of studies uh, in academia about momentum, yet it still continues to work. So this on the left is the total return of the MSCI USA Momentum Index, which is the index that the MTOM ETF tracks. So from 3-1-1985 from to 3-27-2020, this momentum index increased by 8,873%. That compares to 7,087% for the NASDAQ 100, which is the index that the QQQ tracks. So keep in mind, and a lot of people have said this, wait a minute, the MTOM ETF has only existed since 2013. Remember, this is the index that MTOM tracks. So that has data going back far further than MTOM. So again, you can't directly invest in an index. This is just suggesting that the momentum index has actually done better than even the NASDAQ uh, over a very long period of time. This momentum still seems to be working, even after all the academic research done on it. Seventh and final uh, is momentum is easy to apply. So here I've got uh, 7.8 million websites that have the momentum data available to you for free. And I completely made up this number, but the point is you can find momentum data on any website, any financial website. Uh, you go to uh, may take a little bit of work if you want to do you know percentile comparisons or something like that. Um, so maybe I can I can post a video how to, on how to do that uh, if if you guys are interested. But it's widely available, not difficult to apply this. 
Um, so speaking of applying it, how are three ways that you could apply momentum to your investment decisions today? Um, so the first would be just to establish relative momentum requirements. There's a couple ways you could do this. The most common way would be to compare a stock that you're thinking about buying to some kind of index. I would probably suggest the S&P 500. That's just a broad market uh, indicator. And you would say that, you know, I don't want to buy a stock that has relative momentum that is in, say, the bottom 10 or 20 percent of the overall S&P 500. So if, if this stock is one of the worst performing 50 stocks in the S&P 500, then I'm not going to buy it until that changes. And so what that does is it simply allows you to not buy into a company that may be a value trap or, or there may be a very good reason why the stock is going down so much. And in general, you don't want to try to catch those falling knives. Um, you're better off to wait until you have some other investors showing interest in buying the stock as well. Um, so if it's performing poorly, you know, you could always put it on your watch list and just say, yeah, I'm really interested in this stock, but right now the overall market is it's just getting absolutely killed. And I don't want to assume that I know more than the market. So I'm going to wait until the stock at least shows some kind of relative life. And you know, there's a lot of times where I've done this myself, where I've had a stock I wanted to buy, and you know, you you it looks attractive, but the stock's just getting pummeled. And a lot of times, if you just if you wait, you know, the stock will continue to get to get hit. Um, so you can save yourself a lot of pain um, by by establishing those requirements before you buy a company. Uh, another easy way is just to simply use a moving average. Six to 12 months is generally the, um, the momentum research suggests that, that that period works. So that would translate to a moving average of 125 days to 250 days. So you could simply look at a stock and say, you know, I want to buy this stock. It looks great. Everything about it looks great, but the price is below the 200 day moving average, for example. And you could just say, I'm going to buy this stock once it crosses above its 200 day moving average. Um, and just use that maybe as your, 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 your kind of timing mechanism, short term timing mechanism. Again, it, it's probably not going to drastically alter your portfolio, but it could keep you from buying into a couple stocks a little bit too early before they really start to turn. And finally, uh, you can set post-purchase loss limits. So this is very common uh, in investment funds where uh, the manager will basically say, after I buy a stock, if it drops by more than, say, 20%, I'm going to sell it no matter what. And this is something that Ben Graham advocated in his uh, systematic strategy that he promoted um, a few years before his death. Uh, basically, if the stock did not, in his case, it did not go up by a certain percentage after a couple of years, it was automatically sold. Um, you could establish the same kind of loss limits for your own portfolio. If it drops by more than 20%, automatically gets gets sold, um, and that can prevent you from holding on to something that's you know on its way to, to zero or you know a lot lower than than where it was um, where it is today. So. That's another option. You could also set relative limits. So you could say, um, I will automatically sell this if it underperforms the S&P 500 by 20% or underperforms its sector by 20%. So if the market is suggesting that something is really wrong with this company, then I'm, I'm gonna automatically sell it. 